Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley. And we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. Our church meets Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna. We're renovating an old building there going back to the 19th century. We have morning worship at 11, evening worship at 530, followed by a simple meal. We also have a mission work in Logan that meets at 630 p.m at 1315 East 700 North. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination, and we try to stress simple reverent worship, expository preaching, the historic substantive faith of the church, uh, family worship instead of lots of programs and things like that. If you'd like more information, you can check out our church website or go to the website for the television program, ancientpaths.tv. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different this evening. I think that much of the feedback that I've gotten on some of the recent shows has shown that I think that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about who God is and the nature of who we are, the nature of the fall and things like this. And so I thought it would be productive to go back and look at what the Lord tells us in the book of Genesis. Genesis is a story that all too often gets either skimmed over or, or skipped entirely. And I think that if we fail to understand who God is and what He's done there, then the rest of the Bible becomes confused. What we see in the book of Genesis is that God makes all things from nothing. Creation ex nihilo is the, uh, is the old Latin expression for it. Now that term is not found in Scripture, but the principles are found. That God made all things. That He transcends all things. That the heavens of heavens cannot contain Him. When we talk about an infinite eternal God in contrast to an exalted man or some other finite view of God, I think that that gets ignored all too often. We need to be specific about what we mean by this. We believe that all of creation, whether it's this earth, this solar system, this galaxy, this universe, everything was created by God. This God cannot be contained by His creation. That's what we were making reference to. Where it says in His Word that the heavens of heavens cannot contain Him. He says in Isaiah 66, 1, that the heavens are His throne and the earth is His footstool. In Isaiah, it says that the earth is less than dust under his feet, and yet he is mindful of us. This God is tremendously powerful and wise. And when we look at the scope and the complexity of the creation around us, we begin to get a sense of who this God is. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 1, that the invisible attributes are clearly seen through being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. We were created to be able to understand this world around us. We were given eyes to see the, the wonder and complexity of the creation. We were given the ears to hear. We were given the senses to be able to experience. And through these things to recognize that they are the handiwork of God Himself. When we talk about the scope of God's creation, it's something that boggles the mind. The distance from this earth to the moon is a little less than a quarter million miles. From here to our sun is over 90 million miles. When you get much beyond that, you start having to talk in terms of light years. And a light year is the distance that light can travel in one year traveling at over 186,000 miles per second. The distance from the sun to the closest star is over four light years, roughly 25 trillion miles. Our sun and the closest star are two of roughly 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. From our sun to the middle of the galaxy, is roughly 30,000 light years. It begins to baffle the imagination when we begin to think about the distances involved, the size and the complexity of creation. 
You have roughly 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. With the technological advancements through the Hubble Space Telescope and things such as this, now we have astronomers estimating that there are somewhere between 10 billion and 100 billion galaxies that are visible with the current technology, of which ours is actually a small one. The larger galaxies have over a trillion stars each. The closest galaxy to the Milky Way is over two million light years. You go out into the night and if you had a flashlight powerful enough and shone it out into the darkness, the distance involved two million years just to make it to the, close, to the edge of the closest galaxy, of which there are somewhere between 10 billion and 100 billion they estimate. The God who spoke all that into existence from nothing is the God that we're talking about. Not only is he, is he marvelous in terms of his power and wisdom to create something so vast and so complex, but when you go down from, from the, from the uh, unimaginably large to the unimaginably small, one of the uh, interviews we did a few months ago was with the president of the Atheist of Utah. And one of the things we asked was, you know, your whole system is built on the idea that you have a single self-replicating cell that then develops from there and gets complexity through, uh, through natural selection. But the cell that was so uh, insignificant in Darwin's day, something that seems so simple, has become unimaginably complex as science has been able to understand what actually goes into a cell that can replicate itself. Some scientists have said that, that if, uh, if Darwin was looking at the cell as a, as a mud hut, the real complexity is like that of a galaxy. Or if it's a bow and arrow, it's like the space shuttle in comparison to the way Darwin understood it. There are roughly a hundred trillion cells in your body, and every one of those cells carries DNA. That DNA, if stretched out, would have three billion combinations of chemicals that would tell, that help define who you are in terms of your cellular structure. Each DNA, if stretched out, would reach over five feet. It would be only about a 50 trillionth of an inch wide. It would be unbelievably tiny in terms of its visibility and thickness. But stretched out, if you were to take this bundle out of the nucleus of, of a human cell, it would be five feet long. If all the DNA in your body were stretched end to end, it would reach to the sun and back 20 times, roughly 93 million miles, 20 times there and back. The God that we're talking about in the Bible is the God who creates all of this by the word of his power, who speaks all these things into existence. He creates the heavens and the earth, and he creates all of the animals, all the plants. He creates everything. And then he creates in this universe one special creature. He creates man. In the same way as all the rest of creation, man is a creature. And yet distinct from all the other creatures, he's created in the image of God. He is made to have fellowship with God. He makes Adam, he makes a helper for Adam, Eve. They are both in the image of God. He puts them into paradise there in the garden. There's no sin. They are given dominion over all the animals, over all of the earth. They are essentially king and queen of the earth. They are given access to everything they could possibly want save one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good, of good and evil. 
They're not even barred from the tree of life. They have whatever they could desire. They're in paradise. They're given dominion over all these things. Only that they are under God. They are to have fellowship with Him. There's no sin, no death, no pain. None of these things. But they are to tend the garden. Only one thing had ever been said not to be good, and that was for man to be alone. And God remedied that. And God looks at everything He creates. And God Himself declares everything very good. It's against that backdrop that we see the entry of the serpent and the lie that you shall be as gods. The promise was made that there was more. God had not been good. The idea was that God had somehow withheld something very good from Adam and Eve and that they could have more by trying to determine by themselves what is good and what is evil. By rebelling against Him, they could have more than simply being king and queen of the earth. They could be as God. What that brings is destruction. We have people who tend to trivialize these things because they say, well, what, what's the big deal? What's, what's the big deal about eating forbidden fruit? But they fail to understand the very nature of it. When God says something is very good and we say no, what are we doing? We're, first and foremost, we're saying that God cannot be trusted, that God is deceptive or God is wrong, that we can judge God. We can take God, bring Him down, put Him in the defendant's dock, and we can judge what He has to say. Not that we take God at His word, but rather we judge God. That is idolatrous in the extreme. It is blasphemous as well because it is ascribing to God uh, either a character of defect or a character of ill will. Either God doesn't know that there's better for Adam and Eve or He doesn't want them to have it. God has something better for Adam and Eve, but He's not going to give it to them. And so when they presume to take that fruit and to eat it apart from what God has told them, God has told them, do not eat it. It is rebellion in the extreme. It is, un it is ingratitude in the extreme. God has given them paradise. God has given Adam a mate. He has, he has put them in this wonderful place. He has fellowship with them. And what, is, what do they return with? They return with wanting more. And so Adam eats of the for forbidden fruit and becomes a sinner. And he and Eve are put out of the garden. And they bring upon themselves a curse and I won't spell out all the different things about the curse, but I think that it begins, we begin when we see these things to understand the world around us. We begin to understand how do we explain the greatness of man? We cannot explain the greatness of man through uh, evolution, through any of these different things. We can't explain the genius of man. And there is a genius. Look at art, at least what real art, not the anti-art that has been pawned off on us for the last generation or two. Modern art is not art. It is anti-art. It is a rebellion against uh, beauty and art and, and God and everything else. We'll deal with that some other time. But look at the brilliance of art, the brilliance of, of music, the brilliance of technology. We have man able to split atoms. We have man able to construct amazing technologies. The things like the, the Hubble Space Telescope to be able to, to view these things. We're able to send out 
uh, exploratory missions to uh, the moon and then with, with uh, landers to Mars and beyond. We're able to map DNA. We're able to uh, even now cure some genetic problems. There is a genius in man. And that is explained that we were created different. We were created in the image of God. And yet, there's a fallenness in man. Man is evil. Man turns that genius to his own destruction and to the destruction of his neighbors. We see the genius in medical science turn to creating new drugs that become a, a way of enslaving yourself. People invent something like LSD or heroin or something like that, and it becomes a means of our own destruction. We see that there's a genius in terms of aeronautics, and yet what do we use that for? We end up using it to destroy other people. People who may be a genius, uh, someone who's a genius in terms of music or art or something like that, often they end up turning to their own destruction. You look at someone, an inventor like uh, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was one of the greatest inventors of the 20th century, and yet he, he, he goes mad because he is at war with God. And there is something wrong inside of all of us. God himself says before the flood, that uh, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, that's one thing to describe before the flood because you had uh, Cain and his descendants, you had people like Lamech, uh, the first polygamist boasting that Cain had killed uh, Abel and was going to be avenged seven times and he was going, to, if uh, he had been a murderer as well and he was going to be avenged 70 times seven. And he's boasting in this, and you see this rebellion against God, and that, that evil grows and grows. Well, then God sends the flood. Problem is, it doesn't, it doesn't destroy the fundamental problem of man. We are all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. We are all, by nature, slaves to sin. And God says, even after the flood, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Man in Adam is dead spiritually. And we are subject to physical death as well. And it's when we begin to plumb the depths of these things that we begin to understand the profundity of what we see in Christ. We're going to flesh this out a little more. I'm going to was intending to open up the phone lines in a few minutes, but we already have a phone call. So I'll go ahead and take Randy from Taylorsville. Randy, good to have you with us this evening. Hey, how are you doing today? Doing well, thanks. Okay, I was just uh, curious. You know, you're talking about how uh, when God makes something sacred or says something is good, that um, we shouldn't um, down, you know, put it say it's not. And. Uh, um, my, I'm just thinking with the Sabbath, why is it that most churches keep Sunday instead of the, the seventh-day Sabbath? Well, we see the change take place in the New Testament. Um, this is, we're, we're dealing specifically with creation tonight. We'll, we've dealt with the Sabbath before. Uh, if you go back on our archives, you can actually see uh, some of the discussion on that. It's been, I think, about about four months, maybe. Uh, if you go to ancientpaths.tv, you can see some of the discussion there. There is a, um, actually just just preached on um, one sermon on the Sabbath this past Sunday evening. We're going through the Ten Commandments, and I'm finishing it up this uh, this Sunday. You need to understand, uh, are you Seventh-day Adventist? Yes, I am. Okay. I, I attended Seventh-day Adventist schools as a kid. Um, I've known Seventh-day Adventists practically my whole life. Uh, I'm fairly familiar with their with their teachings. Yeah. Uh, I don't have time to, to get into all of it this evening, or else I'll have to completely drop what I had intended to cover. But but I'll take a moment because it does come up from time to time. You need to recognize that William Miller said that he 
read the Bible by himself, untainted from all human traditions, and he understood what no one had ever understood before, that Jesus Christ was going to come back in 1843. Well, yeah, they, they, uh, what they did in this calculation, well, but not what, the, the date was right. L listen, was um, wrong. L listen. Hey, I know all. Of, I know exactly what. All right. Because hey, uh, listen, most of our most of our viewers but, don't. So I'm gonna uh, if, I'm gonna give you an answer if you can if you can bear with me for a moment here. Okay. I'm, um, I just got it. They but. they end up changing the date and then uh, to 1844. When that doesn't pan out, you end up with several different movements that come out of that. You had the, um, the second Adventist who believed that that was the beginning of the last generation. Uh, you had... Um, See, a lot of people say it was one guy or it was like Ellen... Well, where it was listen, you, the, uh, Europe. I don't really have time to, to argue with you tonight on all this. I can give you an answer and you can go back and look at the other stuff. You can, you can write me. I can point you to some other as well. Scripture. But... Um, I was saying, can you give me a scripture that says this? Like I, like I said, I've gone through a great deal of this already, a show on the Sabbath. You can go back and see our archives. I can't do that over and over and over. Uh, I'm happy to write to you if you, if you want to write me. But I'm going to give you a, a, a short answer. I appreciate the call if you'll watch the answer over the, phone, over, over the air, please. Right. Um, he makes a good point that when God says something is holy, we need to take that seriously. Unfortunately for Seventh-day Adventists, the Sabbath becomes the focus of everything. Because out of the different groups that were part of that great disappointment, Ellen G. White became an acknowledged prophetess of a group uh, that they believed, they were the closed door Adventists. They believed that uh, 1844 marked the closing of the door, that no one could be saved after that date. And they thought Jesus was going to appear fairly quickly. Well, that didn't pan out so well. They kept having kids, which was kind of a bummer, thinking that there was no way they could be saved. They then ended up changing their view to the, to the idea that Jesus had come back invisibly in investigative judgment. That is not biblical. Uh, it's only when you create this crazy quilt out of the, out of the scriptures. Now, how do you deal with the fact that you're teaching something that's ridiculous? Well, like we talked about last week, if you're, if you're, if you're at war with historic biblical Christianity that you believe that no one, and believe no one has ever understood it, but now you do, what do you do? Well, the best defense is a strong offense. So what you do is you attack and you shift the ground away from the second coming. You know, the, before the great disappointment, when they, when they believe that they, uh, had biblical grounds. Uh, they, they took the 70 weeks of Daniel and Daniel 9, brought it over to, they said, aha, a, a, a day, which was not anywhere in the text. Um, it's from the English translation. They couldn't read Hebrew. Uh, they said, here's a day. It's a prophetic day as a year. So let's take that over to Daniel 8, back a chapter, and we'll make it 2,300 years. And 2,300 years from this date that we set for Daniel, 1844. And they went out declaring that Jesus was coming back. There were all these uh, events leading up to, that uh, gave them the idea that, that, that the end was at hand. Uh, you had the explosion of the volcano in 1818, I think it was, uh, that caused the year with no summer. They had snow in New England in June. Um, you had uh, a Leonid meteor shower where this massive number of meteors was out. It was supposed to be bright as noonday in New England uh, in the middle of the night. You had all these different things. And they were certain this was it. Well, it didn't pan out so well. So what you do is you shift the focus off of that to the Sabbath. And there had been some Seventh-day Baptist, very small little group out there that held to this. They took that position and uh, Ellen G. White began teaching that that was that Sunday worship was the mark of the beast, and they uh, they totally ignored uh, the worship on the first day of the week in the New Testament. Totally ignored the witness of the early church, and they said Constantine invented Sunday worship because he was a secret sun worshiper, and the Christians that for 250 years had stood up against all these Roman persecutions, um, they had Christianity made legal, but on one condition. They had to worship on Sunday, and that's the mark of the beast. 
That's bogus. Um, we, we've dealt with some of this before. Uh, if you, uh, we dealt with it some, some last Sunday night. If you want to hear some more, uh, we'll be dealing with it this Sunday evening, 530. We're actually going through the Ten Commandments, and we're on the Fourth Commandment. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about are the two Adams. We have tried to, I've, I've tried to show you the Adam from the book of Genesis, and I'm trying to draw that to what Christ is doing in the New Testament. Christ comes as the second Adam. You see this parallel made between Christ and the first Adam in Romans 6. Christ comes to do what Adam was commanded to do. He comes and He obeys. He fulfills the law. He does everything that Adam was supposed to do, but then He trades places. He takes our sins upon Himself that we can have His righteousness counted to us. And He goes to the cross and He pays that penalty. And when we're united with Christ in faith, we're united in His death and in His resurrection. His life is our life. And we're going to flesh this out a little bit more. But I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation, um, we are going to try to stay on subject. I'm open to a number of things, but um, let's not try to stick the Sabbath into the middle of talking about the, um, the nature of the two atoms. But if you want to join in the conversation, call us here at the station, 973-TV20. Remember, you've got to dial the 801 area code now for everything. That's um, one of the drawbacks of technology. But 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-8820. You see over and over that Jesus is the fulfillment of a host of things from Scripture. You see that He is that prophet that was promised to be like Moses, but one that the people would hear. You see that He is uh, the fulfillment of uh, the, the picture of what Israel was called to be and the new Joshua. We've been, we've been looking at the transfiguration uh, on Sunday mornings. We just finished transfiguration going through Luke's Gospel. You see there in the feeding of the 5,000 this, this thing reminiscent of, of, of Moses. And you have later on in the chapter Jesus being glorified, His face transformed. And it's reminiscent of Exodus 34 where Moses had been up on the mountain with God. He comes down and His face is glowing because He's been in the presence of God. And this, you have this veil that He has to cover His face with because the people are unnerved. Well, there's this comfort that Jesus gives His disciples that He's told them He has to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, that they have to take up their crosses daily and follow Him. And yet in the midst of all this, there's this comfort where essentially He pulls back the veil and shows His glory. Uh, you, you see in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness that just like in uh, Exodus, uh, it quotes in Matthew's Gospel, out of Egypt I've called my son. You have um, that that is fulfilled in Christ. Well, we go back to Hosea 11.1, 1, it's talking about Israel. Well, the next thing you see is baptism. Israel was baptized in the Red Sea and in the cloud, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says. And then they're, they're tempted in the wilderness. Forty years for every day that the spies were in the land. Well, Christ is driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the, of the devil for 40 days. And he tempts him. And every time Jesus responds with something from the book of Deuteronomy, well the setting of that is on the edge of the promised land. Israel's about to go in. Who leads them into the promised land? Joshua. Yeshua. Greek form, Jesus. Jesus comes as the fulfillment of all these things. There are all these different things that are pictures in the Old Testament of Christ, but the very first one we see back in Genesis 3, right after the fall, the promise that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. The serpent had brought about destruction, but the seed of the woman would bring deliverance. 
And Christ comes as that. He comes as the fulfillment. He comes to, to bring life as the first Adam brought death. And when he's nailed to the cross, what does he wear? He's wearing a crown of thorns, a picture of that curse that was put on the ground for man's sake. The, uh, one of the old Michael Card songs, the thorn cursed ground brings forth a crown. You see this picture of the first Adam bringing death, being a picture of what Christ does in bringing life. If you'd like to join in our conversation tonight, 973-8820, 801-973-8820. We have with us Mary Ann uh, from West Valley. Mary Ann, good to have you with us. Thank you. Good evening, Jason. Uh, do you agree that God gave Adam and Eve the choice whether or not to sin? And yet, if, if predestination takes hold, uh, does, the, does predestination eliminate free will and the ability to make your own choices? No, no, and I'll, I'll answer more fully. Thank you for calling. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate the phone call. The, we need to understand the nature of man in its fourfold state. This is actually a great question. What is the nature of man when he's first created? He is able to sin. He can act from his own free will. Now, free will never violates or is violated by God's predestination. The, the, the brothers of Joseph did what they wanted to do in hating him, planning his death, betraying him, selling him into slavery. And yet, what does Joseph say? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. There's no... There's no contradiction in these things. Uh, Judas was not dragged by God against his will and made to betray Christ, and yet he was the son of perdition. He was the one that uh, led these things. We're told by Peter in Acts chapter 2 that, that the whole crucifixion of Christ, the greatest evil man has ever perpetrated, was according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So a little aside there. Um, so in the, in the state of innocency, man is able to sin. What happens when man sins? When, when Adam sins, the, the old statement, in Adam's fall, sin we all. We all are sinners because we are, we are the seed of Abraham, I mean, we're seed, seed of uh, Adam. I quoted to you from Genesis 6 and Genesis 8, uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, our hearts are, are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Uh, Isaiah says that we drink iniquity like water. Uh, Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Paul says in Romans that we are slaves to sin. Uh, Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So before the fall, man was able to sin. But after the fall, man was not able not to sin. Man is a slave of sin. He acts according to his nature. His nature has become corrupt. A snake is going to be a snake. Uh, you, you, can take a, you can take a chihuahua and dress it up in uh, a sombrero and a uh, poncho and everything else, but it's not human. You, you, can, you can make it walk around on two legs, but it's still a chihuahua. We are by nature sinners. We are by nature rebels against God. The natural man is at enmity with God. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. First, uh, First Corinthians, they are foolishness to him. So the natural man is a slave to sin. He is not able not to sin. So first he was able to sin, but then not able not to sin. So those are the first two states of man. Third state of man is as a Christian. When someone becomes a Christian, their heart is changed. The Holy Spirit indwells them. They are united with Christ, and then they are able not to sin. There's a way of escape. The Holy Spirit doesn't allow us to, to wallow in sin. We may, we may stumble, 
but he convicts us. The Lord whom he loves, he chastises. And so the Christian is able not to sin. Doesn't mean he stops sinning altogether. But we don't live in sin, and there is a way of escape, and we are progressively sanctified as the Holy Spirit conforms us to the image of Christ. Uh, Hebrews 10 makes a great point of this, that by one sacrifice, Christ has perfected those that are being sanctified. Am I perfect? Yes and no. Yes, I actually am perfect. <laughs> if my, my, my wife should be watching this, and she thankfully knows the, the, the proper theological basis of that. I am not perfect in myself. I'm still a sinner. I'm being sanctified. I'm perfect because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to me. His righteousness has been given to me as my sins were given to Him. I have been perfected by that one sacrifice. I who am being sanctified. Hebrews 10 has that, that difference. It is an accomplished act that we, when we are in Christ, we have been perfected, even though we are being sanctified. Christ's righteousness is counted to us, and therefore, being united with Him in His death and in His resurrection, united with Him in His, in His righteousness, we are seen as perfect, without spot, without blemish. This is, this is the... Um, people all, all too often water this down and sweeten it up, but, but we are saved. We are being saved, but we're saved in Him. We are, we are as justified as we will ever be because justification is a declaration of righteousness and Christ's righteousness is sufficient and in Him we're free. So, we're, so man was first able to sin, then not able not to sin. The believer is able not to sin, but there's more ahead for the believer. When we are with Him, when we are glorified, when, we are, when, when all this is over, then we are not able to sin. And if you like things, if you think they sound better in Latin, the old, uh, the old theologians, passe peccare, able to sin. Non passe non peccare, not able not to sin. Passe non peccare, able not to sin. And then finally, non posse peccari, not able to sin. You see, in Christ, we're not simply brought back to the garden. Adam was innocent, but Adam was not righteous. Adam had not fulfilled all his obligations. Christ positively keeps the law. He has an active and passive obedience that is counted to us. It's not just that we're made innocent in Him, we are, we are counted with His fulfillment of the law. And so in Him, we have no greater need. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation, 973-8820. That's 801-973-8820. Isaiah 40 has a great passage that I think helps draw the distinction between the God of the Bible and the God of popular imagination. It says there, starting at verse 21, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. You see, part of the problem, when we start talking about grace and works, when we start talking about, uh, you know, how is a Christian to live and everything else, all too often what people do is they begin in the middle and they kick up dust and confuse themselves and everyone else. We have to go back to the fundamental question, who is God? From there, everything else begins to make sense. We see the greatness of God. What we also see is the holiness of God. Adam became a sinner. What is God's view towards that sin? In the Book of Mormon it says that Adam sinned that man might be and man is that he might have joy because the view is that, that sin, the, the violation of the second commandment that God gave was necessary to keep the first commandment. God said, be fruitful and multiply and don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You had to break the second to keep the first. Wrong. Adam brought in this world of rape and murder and lies and tyrants and slaughter and pollution and injustice and uh, enmity between us and the animals and all the evil that you see in the world was the result of the fall. God's view of sin is far more serious than people like to make out, which makes the work of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, coming to save us that much more profound. Because when we look at the God of Scripture, we find He takes sin very seriously. That just like there's a temptation to say, they ate some fruit, what's the big deal? God takes these things seriously, and He is the standard. He has spoken. He has told us how serious this is. It's not left up to popular opinion. We don't take polls. And we don't rank things according to what we might desire. God drowns every man, woman, baby, kitty cat, puppy dog, and bunny rabbit on the planet, apart from those that are on the ark. You see these pictures in, in nurseries often that have uh, Noah's ark with the animals streaming off, and there's a rainbow, and it's really cute and everything. But that's a fiction. It's not a fiction that it, there was no one in an ark. It's a fiction because it's a sentimentalized picture. The reality was there were probably a whole lot of dead bodies floating, I mean, laying around. This was a judgment of God in which every person on the planet, apart from those on the ark, is killed by God Himself. You see God's judgments over and over in Scripture. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offer worship to God, which was not what he, offer, what, what he had prescribed. Now, in our day, that's considered to be innovative. That's considered to be something that shows our love for God, that we don't stick to the old rules. We, we want, to come, want it to come from our hearts. We want it to come from, uh, from something we dream up. God doesn't tell Nadab and Abihu, I really wish that you'd do it the way I said. Instead, the fire of the Lord goes out and consumes them. You see God's judgments over and over. He says there, I will be sanctified by all those who approach me. This God is not only unimaginably powerful and wise, He's unimaginably holy. When there's a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath, they ask the Lord, what do we do with him in the book of Numbers? God says, Stone him. Kill him. Two men are, are fighting. And in the midst of the fight, one of them blasphemes the Lord's name. They ask the Lord, what do we do with him? Stone him. You see God's judgments over and over. David is excited to hurry and bring the ark to Jerusalem. And so he puts it on a cart. 
drawn by oxen. And nowhere did God say, don't put it on a cart. He did say, carry it with staves, with poles. They put it on the cart. The oxen stumble. Uzzah puts out his hand to protect the ark. God strikes him dead for his presumption. You see God's judgments over and over. When David commits adultery with Bathsheba and kills Uriah, God judges by killing his son. You see him stir up David to number the people. And then he judges. He did it because he was angry with Israel. And then he judges by killing 70,000 of them. The God of the Old Testament is scary. And if you bother to read the New Testament, you find out God's still scary. Because God hasn't changed. People love to try to create these fictions that the God of the Old Testament's mean and nasty and Jesus somehow made him nice and you know now we've got a Mr. Rogers with a beard who uh, just wants to be our neighbor. That's not the God of the Bible. You find out Nadab, not Nadab by here, but rather Ananias and Sapphira, Book of Acts. They lie to the Holy Spirit. They told a lie. We don't tend to take lies very seriously, especially when they come from our politicians. God kills them. The book of Revelation says that all liars end up in the lake of fire. God takes sin seriously. In Revelation 6, you have the kings, the great ones, all the people crying out to the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day, great day of His wrath is coming. Who can stand? The wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of Jesus Christ who comes no more meek and lowly on the colt full of an ass. He comes instead on a charger for war. He comes destroying His enemies with a sword going out of His mouth. You find the Lamb opening those seals. You find the Lamb in Revelation 14 that those who receive the mark of the beast, that they are tormented in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. We have these people who love to say, well, hell is the absence of God. Because they don't want to picture God as actually wrathful. But what you see is that hell is actually being in the presence of God in His wrath. This God who hates sin that much, including Jesus, who hates the sin so much, He sends His Son to be the second Adam. He sends His Son to be the fulfillment of what you see there in Genesis with, with Abraham. Abraham was asked to offer his son as a burnt offering. Once again, uh, I've got Michael Card on the, on the brain tonight. Um, old Michael Card song, What Abraham was asked to do, he has done. He has offered his only son. It's a double entendre. goes back to Abraham does what he's supposed to do, but then God provides a substitute. He provides a ram caught in the thicket. And then the chorus goes again. What Abraham was asked to do, he, God, has done. There in Genesis, we see this promise of the seed of the woman. We see that promise that this, this slavery, this destruction that has been brought about through the first Adam will be undone. I think we have a picture of it right there in Genesis 3 when, Ab when Adam and Eve had made for themselves uh, coverings of fig leaves, trying to cover themselves in something of their own invention, God strips them of that. I think we have a parallel to what we see in the sacrifice of Cain in chapter 4. He clothes them in coats of skin. There was, a, there was a death that day. He doesn't just give them coats of skin because uh, fig leaves weren't going to hold up that well. And he, you know, it's like, well, since I'm going to cast you out of the garden and put the angel here to keep you out, might as well give you something that will hold up a little bit better. You know, uh, I'll be your haberdasher for the day. That's not what's taking place. 
just like with the sacrifice of Cain, they're, they're, they're trying to come to God on their terms. They're trying to cover their own, they're, they're ignoring their sins. But just like with the sacrifice of Abel, there was the shedding of blood. They clothed them in coats of skin. The promise was, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. First Adam is delivered through the death of another. It's a pointer to the second Adam coming and, and, and justifying us through his death. He comes and takes our sins upon himself and pays their penalty so that we can be counted righteous. We have a few minutes left if you'd like to join the conversation. 801-973-TV20. 801-973-8820. It's when we go back to Genesis, when we go back and see that God creates everything. He creates the heavens and the earth. He creates light before He even creates the sun. God doesn't need means. You ever notice that? When is light created? First day. When's the sun created? Fourth day. It's in that... God doesn't need means. He uses means often, but He doesn't have to. This God creates everything. And when we begin to understand who He is and the fellowship that we're to have with Him and how that fellowship was broken through sin and is restored in Christ, we're driven to our knees. Because at the end of Revelation, what do you see? You see that through Christ, we're back to paradise. The tabernacle of God is with men. No more is there this alienation. No more is God dealing with us in this terrifying way. But there has been reconciliation. There's been peace that has been made. Christ fulfills all these things. It's, it's unimaginable to me when you see that this God creates all things, that from everlasting to everlasting He is God, that there was no God formed before Him, for Isaiah 43.10, neither shall there be formed after, one formed after Him. And yet we have people that turn around and say, as, Adam, as man is now, God once was, as God is now, man may become. No. There is better awaiting us. The promise is that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has ever entered into the mind of man the things that await us. But the problem is, just like in Romans 1, they do, we do not glorify Him as God neither are thankful, but become vain in our imaginations. Our foolish hearts are darkened. Professing ourselves to be wise, we become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. That's idolatry. That's not the God who made the universe. That's not the God who sits over the circle of the earth and all the people are like grasshoppers. This isn't the one who says, the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. This isn't the God who says that, uh, in His Word that the heavens and heavens of heavens cannot contain Him. We don't understand His glory. We don't understand His holiness. And therefore, we don't ever understand His love because this infinite, eternal, omnipotent God is the same God nailed to that cross naked outside Jerusalem nearly two millennia ago for sinners for His enemies, for those who hated Him. Jesus didn't come to help good people save themselves. He prays as they're laughing at Him, Father, forgive them. And we have people like the Jehovah's Witnesses who try to say that, uh, which by the way came out of the Adventist movement, came out of the second Adventist when their second date didn't work out so well. They added 70 years to 1844 and got 1914, and that's how that whole thing came up, just to tie it into what we were discussing earlier. But when we understand that the God of the universe, the God 
for who created all things, for whom all things were created, who holds them in being, that he is the one nailed there for sinners and says, come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. How do we play games with that? How do we say that the Bible's boring? And we have, we, we just, we, we want our Ellen G. White or we want our, our Joseph Smith or we want somebody else because we're not going to bother to read the Bible for ourselves. Read the Bible. Read about the first Adam and the wonder of what's performed in the second. When we've come to the end of the show, uh, I'd like to invite you to tune in next week and uh, we'll be discussing some more of these things. Also, if you'd like to see some of our past shows, they're archived at ancientpaths.tv. If you would like to visit with us, we meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna, the big old white church there uh, building. And we meet 5.30 p.m. going through Gospel of Luke Sunday mornings, uh, Ten Commandments Sunday night. Come Sunday night, we'll feed you a simple meal. We also have our mission work in Logan that meets at 6.30 p.m. 1315 East 700 North. We are a church that tries to emphasize the solas of the uh, Reformation, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christo, soli Deo gloria. If you want to tune in next week, I'll tell you the Latin. But next time, until next time, we wish you the Lord's blessings. Good night.